You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 233 Honor and Shame Culture with David Da Silva. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Mike, um, I'm excited about David. I love David. We uh, had him on a last time at, S- at SBL, and SBL is just around, around the corner in a couple months, so maybe we'll get him again. Well, excited. we'll certainly try. I'm excited to hear what y'all talk about this week. Well, we're thrilled to have Dr. David De Silva on the podcast. Uh, our listeners will be familiar with David through some of the short interviews that we've done in the past at SBL, but now we get him for a whole episode. And in this case, there really couldn't be a better guest to cover our topic. We want to talk about honor and shame culture and how that relates to biblical interpretation. So David, welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast. Thank you so much, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. And and to refresh the memories of our Listeners, we've gotten a lot of new listeners. The podcast keeps growing. Could you give us a brief introduction as to who you are? Okay. Um, I work as professor of New Testament and Greek at Ashland Theological Seminary. I've been there for actually 23 years. Wow. Um, And I, I love writing and scholarship, and so I invest a lot of energy there. On the side, um, I am ordained um, an elder in the United Methodist Church, and I have served as an organist choir director for 33 years. I'm married, we have three sons, and a stupid dog. (laughs) And what's your dog's name? Athena, the doggess of wisdom. (laughs) The doggess of wisdom. Yeah, we have one of those too. But... uh... (laughs) I like to say my pug when it stares off into space is working on equations, but uh, I think we know better. Hey, um, you know, while we don't want to forget this, even though this is peripheral to, uh, you know, what we're going to talk about today, but you also write fiction. Why don't you say something about that? Sure. Thanks. Um, I wrote one novel, which was published in 2015. It's called Day of Atonement, a novel of the Maccabean Revolt. And um, I got into that because the story of the Hellenizing reform and its aftermath and the uh, the lengths to which some Jews went to hold on to covenant loyalty, on the one hand, I'm thinking of the martyrs, to uh, recover uh, the political independence that would assure the possibility of continuing to live by Torah. I'm thinking of the Maccabean army. Uh, just was such a fabulous story. I wanted to get people into it people that I knew would never pick up first and second Maccabees. So <laughs> right. <laughs> which is a which is a pretty large crowd. <laughs> uh, now we mentioned that uh that novel when we did our, our last interview at SBL, but I just wanted to bring it up again because, you know, uh whether it's whether you call it historical fiction or fictionalized history, I mean that that's just a good vehicle. Uh, to get people into content, especially the way you described it there. Thanks. It was fun to try to bring a world to life. We're not just dealing with texts. We're dealing dealing with feelings, motivations, pressures. What What is it really like to live out these values? Actually, we get into a fair amount of honor and shame exchanges, yep. patron-client exchanges. What does purity look like? on a daily, weekly, annual basis uh, and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. Well, I want to introduce our topic uh, in a particular way today. I'm going to read the opening paragraph of your entry in the Dictionary of New Testament uh, Backgrounds on Honor and Shame. Of course, you're the author. And I'm going to read that, and then I'm going to ask you to unpack it a little bit as we begin. So you wrote, Honor refers to the public acknowledgement of a person's worth, granted on the basis of how fully that individual embodies qualities and behaviors valued by the group. First century Mediterranean people were oriented from from early childhood to seek honor and avoid disgrace, meaning that they would be sensitive to public recognition or reproach. 
where different cultures with different values existed side by side, it became extremely important to insulate one's own group members against the desire for honor or avoidance of dishonor in the eyes of outsiders, since only by so doing could one remain wholly committed to the distinctive culture and values of the group. This struggle is particularly evident in the New Testament, as church leaders seek to affirm the honor of Christians on the basis of their adherence to Jesus, while insulating them from the disapproval they face from non-Christian Jews and Gentiles alike. That's the end of the quote. Now, David, this sounds a little bit like peer pressure to me. <laughs> uh, you know, can you unpack the you know, what what you know you just heard me read, and of course that came from you uh, for our audience. And is, am I right or wrong? Peer pressure is that too simplistic? How do we look at this? Actually, it, it probably is not too simplistic. Um, it's the case, though. I mean, let's not imagine the first century Mediterranean as a giant locker room. Where guys are, you know, just uh, yeah, snap behaving like <laughs> yeah, and behaving like junior high schoolers everywhere, but um, but yes, we keep each other in line with the values that keep our society uh, running well, moving predictably, and 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 moving forward. And um, as I'm brought up in this environment, having the approval of my peers and my superiors is of immense importance. Being recognized as a person of worth, as a person who has value. And that value is granted um, largely on the basis of the degree to which I exhibit the values and practices that keep the society functioning well. So if that's peer pressure, I mean, it's, it's, it's a much more mature peer pressure. It's a uh, uh, it, it's peer pressure that holds together really the most important values and practices of a given society. Now, I, when I first heard of this, um, you know, years ago, it was in the context of missionary work where, you know, you'd, you'd hear a missionary or someone who had, you know, considerable field experience comment on, you know, how doing certain things in, in line with or either recognizing this shames a person or this honors a person as opposed to just sort of propositionally telling them something, um, how that really matters in essentially how missionaries in this case were able to uh, become acclimated to the culture, become accepted by a culture, not be perpetually perceived as an outsider uh, that sort of thing. So when it when it comes to the New Testament, I guess where I'd like to to one of the the things that pops into my head right away is, you know, we tend to think of Christians in the early church, uh, and and really even now, as governing their lives completely by a set of propositions. Okay, mm. some simple example: Mosaic Law, the Torah. Okay, whatever. Uh, you know, which, which, you know, a lot of that gets carried into the New Testament and reaffirmed both in word and, in, you know, certainly in conduct by the early church. But, but this goes considerably beyond merely sort of proof texting a behavior. So, can you get us into talking about how how this worked, either culturally or specifically in the church, and then? I'm just telegraphing where I want to go here. You know, ultimately, I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's the relationship behaviorally for Christians? What's the role of their culture as opposed to truth they are told by an apostle or teachings of Jesus handed down, the more propositional kinds of things? How do those things work together? But, you know, how, what does this look like? Um, give us a few examples, you know, culturally. These are great questions, great trajectories, um, and not to jump the gun, because you might eventually want to talk about this, but mm -hmm. I was interested just to hear as you started that you first really engaged these concept, concepts in conversations with missionaries, mm -hmm. because from a different point of view, I have been um, astounded and actually to a large extent gratified by how much missionaries have found work in readings of scripture from the point of view of honor and shame, uh, how this has 
helped them uh, mm -hmm. package is the wrong word, but uh, conceive of the gospel, proclaim the gospel, embody the gospel in modern contexts that are still honor shame cultures. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, uh, it was Werner Mischke in his global gospel. I think he was the one who was talking about how really the majority of the world's cultures out there are much more attuned to the social dynamics of honor and shame than we are. So this really helps them in their work. However, that wasn't your question. Uh, <laughs> no, but that, that, I mean, I, it, it, I think it'd be really hard to dispute that. I mean, even I'm reading a book now on uh, the death of Western culture. <laughs> Happy oh, wow. reading. And, and a, a lot of the book is oriented around what the author refers to as tribalism. Uh, that that's his, you know, sort of rubric uh, for how he talks about exactly what you're describing, you know, how how behavior is molded and perpetuated, and ideas are actually stifled by virtue of the tribe's response to something. So it's actually pretty interesting, but it, it, I wouldn't have any trouble believing uh, what you just said that most of the world thinks in these terms. But you are taking us to the ancient world. Mm -hmm. um, and specifically, this question of propositions versus propositional truth versus uh, living in the midst of these social dynamics. Is that about? Yeah. Is that about right? Yeah. yeah. Ultimately, what? How do those two things correlate, or 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 butt heads? You know, either way. Well, um, I'm thinking about some stories in the Gospels where where certain practices that Moses has commanded. Mm -hmm. So propositions are front and center. Think I thinking about the Sabbath, for example. The Sabbath is something that is commanded by Torah, that it will be observed, how it will be observed. And of course, there's a, a great deal of, of expansion and interpretation as to what constitutes work, what doesn't, how to keep the Sabbath. Um, in the first century synagogues of Galilee, um, the people... Uh, reinforce for one another the importance of this, what has become a major identity marker for the Jewish people. To be part of this group means to observe the Sabbath. Uh, to be part of this group that is favored by God and that enjoys God's uh, protection means keeping the Sabbath. And your failure not you, Mike, but anyone in general, your <laughs> failure to keep the Sabbath both erodes our identity as, as we would say, as people of God, and it threatens our, um, our standing in God's favor, which is predicated upon the covenant. So, you know, the covenant could be seen as a whole bunch of propositions or imperatives, uh, but in living it out, there is a great deal of, of pressure from one another to uh, what remain, uh, remain within the bounds of carrying out those precepts. So I think about Jesus healing on the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. um, a disputed, a disputed uh, work. Is it work? Is it not work? Is it an act of mercy that should be allowed? Is it a work that could take place any other day? And Jesus encounters active resistance. Uh, from leaders of the synagogue. For example, um, uh, Luke 13, that's the one, where a, a woman who has been bent over for some number of years comes into the synagogue and Jesus actually takes the initiative and heals her. The synagogue leader uh, issues a rebuke, not directly to Jesus, but to the people. Don't come here to be healed on the Sabbath. There are six days for work to be done. Uh, come on those days, but not today. So there's this attempt to reinforce the boundaries of Sabbath keeping by putting Jesus down indirectly, by saying he just violated uh, how to observe the stipulation. And, and Jesus seems to understand very clearly this is launched against him because the Lord answers him and says, hypocrites, you do this much on the Sabbath, you, you, you uh, take your animals and untie them and give them water, 
shouldn't we untie this woman from uh, Satan's bondage on this same day? And his opponents can't answer. So in this contest, uh, really about how to keep the stipulation, Jesus wins in this public forum because the people who are there basically judge Jesus' response to be more correct, uh, better landed. And, and, and even yeah. and still consistent, you know, within within their, their own culture, because Jesus doesn't like pull out some verse, you know, from, from elsewhere in the Torah or in the Tanakh and say, well, the Pharisees got this wrong. Here's a competing proposition that's superior. He actually uses their own behavior, you know, their right. own living out, you know, of, of a proposition. Again, what part of what forms their culture. And I like the way you put it. He wins. <laughs> I mean, what can they say? Indeed. So he successfully defended his honor and his authority to really define what Sabbath keeping should be like, what it includes, what it doesn't include. Uh, and then, you know, um, I'm, I'm thinking of a verse in Philo, and of course I can't come up with a reference. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's not going to happen. But I wrote it's it down somewhere <laughs> so I wouldn't have to remember. Um, where Philo talks about how Jews throughout the diaspora act as watchdogs for the ancestral covenant, how they apply social pressure, how they will shame uh, deviations among their own from, from doing those distinctive practices of the Torah. So I guess this is a long way around to saying the propositions if they are going to be in force at all, if, if their practice is going to continue, it depends on the social practices of reinforcement of those practices. It, it, it is still as important to your honor today to be uh, living in line with the Torah. And we are going to treat you as valuable or we are going to treat you as deviant based on, on that. Do you think this is part of what Paul meant? You know, and he, of course, included his own countrymen here. The whole idea of being all things to all men, you know, that, that sort of thing. And, and the, the Jewish culture is included in that because it's very easy for us as Christians to say, well, you know, you, you go over here and you read the Pauline epistles and Paul's like redefining, you know, the, the at least, you know, I, th well, I think that's a fair word. He, he's redefining or, or repurposing, maybe reapplying in a new way this propositional language about the covenant and different covenants, but we'll just say the covenant from the Old Testament and including Gentiles and all of that. And so it's easy for us to say, well, why didn't, you know, later on when, when we have these controversies in, in uh, churches, you know, you could just quote Paul, you could just quote this passage over here and, and that should settle the matter. But it, it seems like Paul is sensitive to the fact even though he, you know, is, is is speaking as an apostle, and he, no pun intended, or maybe pun intended, lays down the law on a, you know, on a few points, um, he's still sensitive to, I don't want to be careful with my terms, I want to say the insufficiency of that art, of that approach, not the insufficiency of, of the truths that he's uh, espousing, but the insufficiency of just proof texting things that he has to make sure his audience knows that he, you know, does view the law positively. I mean, he can, he can criticize dependence on it over here, but then he can affirm it on the other hand. Do you, do you see Paul in that way that he's, he's trying to, to stay within, you know, play within the sandbox, but still doing uh, different things because of his status as the apostle to the Gentiles? Well. Or, but does it depend on what passage you're in? Let me let, let let me answer it this way, and, and and you have to understand that that the Paul of Galatians is much more on my mind these days than sure. than the Paul of of other letters. But um, hmm, I'll back up even one step further. Paul did not get a lot of support from diaspora Jews. Quite the contrary, <laughs> wherever he went. He managed to make himself pretty much unwelcome in the synagogue, persona non grata, within three weeks of preaching, <laughs> which is right. uh, look for the synagogue, impressive. then look for the jail. Yeah, impressive uh, record of alienation. Um, 
again, in that response to Paul, we see shaming. We see the synagogue treating him as a deviant because he's trying to move the ancient boundary markers. Mm -hmm. He's he's, uh, threatening uh, those values and those practices that define our identity and in line with which we conceive of our honor or another person's lack of honor. You know, in Galatians, Paul Paul is really, he's really bracketing the old covenant in a way that is radical, uh, saying that, yeah, that was exactly what God wanted Jews to do between the Exodus and the coming of Christ. And, And end of story at that point. It's informative, but it's not normative at any point after the coming of Christ and the sending of the Spirit. Uh, With a message like that, obviously, he is going to invite radical shaming, and those who he converts to his way of thinking, especially Jews that, that move in that direction, will also be subject to a great deal of deviancy control, a great deal of shaming by their associates, by their families, because really Paul could be seen as an apostate and leading people to apostasy from the covenant Mm -hmm. in what he's saying about the law and in the kind of interaction he's encouraging between Jewish Christians and uncircumcised, non-Torah observant Gentile Christians. Um, That's not the question you asked remotely, but it's what came to mind. This late well, on uh, Friday. But it, 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 it does, well, it sets it up. We should tell listeners that Galatians is on your mind because you just wrote a commentary. It's going to be out. It, it's really soon. I mean, when when is it supposed to be out? Uh, September 18th is okay. the release date from Erdman's. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the context for, for David saying that the, the Paul of Galatians is really what's been on his mind a lot. I can identify with that when you get you get entrenched in a in a lengthy piece of work like that, well, that you pretty much get a one track mind. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Now, well, let's, let's go back to that though, because it, it, in what way, I mean, how do you, and I'm going to, I'm going to ask you to, to be thinking of, you know, scripture here, but also feel free to use your imagination a little bit. Uh, in, in what way do you think the Jewish community would intentionally shame uh, Jews who had converted, Let, and we can use you know the the situation at Galatia uh, as an example or as a springboard. But how how did this work? You know what what did they what would they do? Well, um, there are some official actions that diaspora Jews can take uh, toward their own. They are allowed a certain measure even of corporeal punishment. This is why Paul in 2 Corinthians says he received from the Jews five times the 40 lashes minus one. That was synagogue discipline. Right, from the Jews, for, yeah. From the, from the Jews in diaspora synagogues. Uh, just like he got beaten with rods by Roman officials <laughs> a number of times because he was transgressing um, uh, the norms and practices that Romans found valuable. But in, in a less formal uh, setting, um, families would put pressure on, would cajole, I mean, just verbally cajole pressure uh, uh, a person to give up certain associations that were seen as damaging to the honor of the whole family, because we can't keep our own in line with the covenant. Eventually, what that turns into is disowning, throwing out a deviant family member to protect the honor of the of the larger family unit, uh, this happens among Jews. This happens among Gentiles. If if you're not going to be fixed uh, by us, we're just going to have to disassociate ourselves so that you don't pull our honor rating down by association. <laughs> no, seriously, <laughs> no, I don't know, but it, it makes me laugh because of the you know the thumbs up and the likes and like Yelp. Oh. You know, that kind of... <laughs> It's kind of, so it's our own shame honor system right there. Yeah. Uh, uh, just I don't know. It just that just popped into my head when you said that. It seems to fit to me. Like but, a Greek yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So that, I mean, it, it's interesting that they had 
you know, here you have, they're living in the Roman world, there's Roman law, but then uh, both legally and culturally, they could do this. They could do these things. Um, and that was just, again, the way things were working out, you know, culturally. I mean, it, it, let me let me throw this, this, you know, I don't think this will be too much of a curveball, but, you know, we're we're used to this kind of hold of authority on people in a religious context, maybe from, I guess, not so much nowadays, but I, I think of Catholicism, like medieval Catholicism, where the people were convinced that to go to heaven, we have to, there, there are means of grace, and those means of grace are held firmly in the hand of the institutional church. And so you have these episodes, you know, in, in Western Civ, mid, you know, in the medieval times where uh, somebody would be excommunicated, that which was, you know, we, we look at that and think, well, big deal. Like, who are you? Uh, but, but that was a big deal because you cannot participate in the means of grace of the church, which means you ain't going to heaven anytime soon here. And then they, they, would, they would have interdict where they could put whole geographical areas under excommunication. So there was a strong link to an institution here that would steer the herd, you know, motivate behavior, would shame or basically say so you have to conform, you know, to be back in, in the good graces here. Do you think that the the community, I mean, how strong, how much of a parallel is there to, to the Jewish community of the Second Temple period? I mean, I know it's not the same because of this whole means of grace thing, but the covenant is a big deal. I think we lose sight of the fact that, hey, we were sent into exile because we didn't honor the covenant. And we don't ever want that to happen again. So buck up, dude. You know, <laughs> just, we, we don't think in those terms, but everybody had that on their mind. You know, let that, me, that, was, that was still fresh. Let me just uh, 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 piggyback on that. You have, we went into exile in 721 or 587 BC because we didn't keep the covenant well enough. As we look back and think about ongoing Gentile domination, and especially the things that happened to us under Antiochus IV, uh, that's all interpreted again in almost all of the extant literature in terms of covenant infidelity mm -hmm. on the part of especially Jerusalem uh, elites. If we don't keep the covenant, disaster happens. If that's not enough reinforcement, we have Pompey the Great's invasion, uh, which is a much smaller scale invasion, but still 63 BC. He comes in to settle the dispute amongst the last Hasmoneans. And when Rome comes in to help, Rome never leaves, apparently. But we have another example that, again, the literature of the period, Psalms of Solomon and others, look back on as the result of failure to keep the covenant. And it always leads to national disaster. So all of that reinforces your point to say, yes, if, if we desert the covenant, um, we are likely setting ourselves up for the continued experience of Gentile domination, uh, of life in exile, and the failure ever to see any of those promises that we read in the prophets for restoration. Yeah, so there's, I, I, this, I'm sorry. I was going to say, I, this is important because, you know, our audience, you know, my audience need, needs to realize that this was more than just being an irritant. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Jewish leadership weren't just annoyed like, well, we're right and Paul's wrong and we, we need to win a debate here. You know, he's just kind of a, you know, blithering idiot or something like that. It, it wasn't, it was so much more serious than that. Because like, if we let this guy run around and do this stuff, we are, we could be in, in, in huge trouble, you know, again, with the, the whole being dominated in our own land. Indeed, indeed. So there isn't the same centralized authority yet that you saw in the medieval church. There, there's a, still a, a fair amount of diversity and diffusion uh, among, uh, among Jews. They have a lot of disagreements amongst themselves about how to keep covenants. Just read the Dead Sea Scrolls, where, where this small circle of Jews thinks every other Jew is doing the covenant wrong, but we're going to do it right. We're going to do it so well that God will look upon us and have mercy on, uh, on the nation. And send them all to hell. But um, 
sons right. and daughters of darkness. Yep. Uh, but but they do agree. If you're going to just go off and not observe the Sabbath, if you're going to play fast and loose with dietary laws, if you're going to try to make us like the nations, if you're going to try to break down those boundaries that separate us from the nations, you are endangering the people as a whole. And most of us can agree with that. And most of us will put pressure on you to stop. And that's precisely Paul's mission to break down the dividing wall of hostility from his perspective, which was the the protective palisades that God put around God's precious people from the other perspective. How do you think, I mean, this is, this is good because in a nutshell, what you just said is, look, inviting the nations into the membership of the people of God is one thing is you know we we had that in the old testament there was provisions you know for gentiles living among the israelites and then there was of course conversion uh, or at least in theory uh, so inviting the nations in is one thing but making us like the nations is quite another um you know th- those are two related but different things and one the second one is far more dramatic but how do you think the Jewish community, Jewish leadership would have reacted to passages like Isaiah 66. Because again, it's easy for us to, to think, well, good grief, you know, Isaiah talks about making the Gentiles priests of the Lord. You know, like, couldn't they just read that? I mean, obviously they have to believe, you know, that Jesus was who he said he was and that, you know, they're, they're sort of in this time period now, or they're, this is the kind of thing that, that God is okay with because of this passage. I mean, how do you think the Jewish community would respond to some of these late passages, either exilic or post-exilic passages, that talk about not only Gentile mission, but there are, there are a few of these kind of dramatic ideas in there. I mean, if, if hang on, if, I, I'm, I'm still trying to find Isaiah sure. 66. Hang Let on. Me gr- no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Are you you're looking at it in the Septuagint, right? <laughs> uh, I'm cheating with English. Right. Uh, well, I think in in the the tail end of Isaiah's oracles, you have you have the the the, the forecasting of Gentiles flocking to the worship of the one God, mm-hmm. but you also have verses, and I, I can't put my finger on it the way you're able to uh, with Isaiah. Uh, but the the assurance that the uncircumcised 66, will 21. not. Well, I was thinking about uh, something in the in the fifties, but I can't find it right now. It's yeah. somewhere in my Galatians commentary. <laughs> I can't find it. Get it. Get it in Logos, and you can index that right away. <laughs> Logos. No, I, I, what's I, that? I was thinking of yeah. I was thinking of Isaiah sixty six twenty one. Some of them, again, the, these Gentiles he's been talking about. I will also take for priests and for Levites, says the Lord, you know, so on and so forth. Then you have this new heaven, new earth vision. You know, again, it, 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 you, you can see Paul, and he does this a couple times, you know, like he'll, he'll, he'll point to those sorts of passages, and then that's a propositional argument. I'm just wondering how you think the, the community would respond to him, you know, or, or just that whole idea. I finally found it. Isaiah 52.1. Okay. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. I think they would. I think they would respond. They'd quote yeah, that one. <laughs> check your foreskin at the gate. I right. think they would. They would respond by saying, "Sure, of course, we look forward to the incorporation of the Gentiles as Jews. Um, we look forward to them." Um, uh, pr- uh, proselytizing the full way, taking on the yoke of Torah, just as we hope that all Jews will take on the yoke of Torah completely. This is the future God has for us, not yours, Paul, where we all just set the Torah aside and follow some nebulous spirit who will make some Jesus take on life in us so that it's no longer us who live, but Christ who lives in us. This is, this is an identity we don't want because it means leaving behind so much of the identity that we have prized and by which we have known ourselves to be honorable people or not. Yeah, so it goes right back in, 
to that. Inviting the nations in is one thing, but making us like the nations is quite another. Hmm. You know, that, that, that's going to be the point of contention. What do you think of, uh, I mean, without sort of pinpointing different groups here, but there is a, I think there's a fairly significant movement. I, I don't know if you've noticed any of this in your neck of the woods, but um, I, I don't think it's going to be isolated either to just sort of, you know, internet theology. <laughs> but there, there seems to be a, a, a serious movement that would be, you know, again, akin to what we are sort of accustomed to calling the Judaizing element uh, of the New Testament. Of course, that's, you know, pejorative that's brought on by, you know, the things that Paul is saying. But there seems to be this this sort of propensity among a number of believers to, yes, we accept Jesus as the Messiah, but we should be Jewish. You know, we should, like, do the observe the calendar, observe the food laws, um, observe Sabbath. In other words, sort of make ourselves as as Jewish as possible and yet still try to affirm Jesus as the Messiah. Do you have an opinion on any of that? I mean, and the most well, extreme elements that wind up yeah. dumping Jesus in the end, but without going that far, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually I have had some conversations with uh, someone who was formerly a close friend uh, around this very topic. Uh, and because I expressed my opinion, I have to use the word formally. <laughs> uh, to describe to describe him, which is 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 quite sorrowful in retrospect. But my thought is, on the one hand, sure, it's cool to do a Passover seder. It's cool to dig into the Old Testament heritage of Israel into which we've been grafted. But on the other hand, to begin placing any value on it that says, you will be more Christian by doing these Jewish things, seems to me to fly in the face of the direction in which Paul was going. We will all be more like Christ if we do these things together. And it, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, training Gentiles to be more Jewish in their calendrical observances, their worship practices, or what have you. It was coming together in a in a common new new ground. So I, I, I default to Romans, oh dear, 14 or 15, 14, where, you know, if you do it to honor God, great. Uh, if you do it and that becomes a measure for another person's uh, place in Christ or depth in Christ, uh, then, then you've gone too far. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean that that's basically my take. If this draws you closer to closer to God, you know, in your Christian walk as opposed to dispensing, you know, with what's new about Christianity, you know, if 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 you can avoid that and this is helpful to you spiritually in some way, you know, great. You know, that that that's a wonderful thing. You you know and I are on the same page there. I just I get hit with this a lot. Uh, again, because you know the internet and email and all this stuff that you, there there's a lot of this that sort of is dropped on my doorstep mm-hmm. and you know i I may have a disproportionate view of it because of that, in other words it it's bigness and it, it may actually be small, but there just seems to be this kind of thing going on where I've discovered something about the Old Testament and Judaism, and this unlocks some sort of special knowledge about how to be a better Christian if we do this Jewish thing. Um, I, I, I tend to see a lot of that. So it's, I just wanted to know what your take on that was. Because it, it seems yeah. to me Paul ran into this a lot. And in the context of our discussion, you could see why he would. Again, it, it, it's not something we should sort of make fun of his opponents for, because it was really serious. Again, because of, of what we're talking about here, this shame and honor, and then in a transcendent sort of way, this whole notion of exile and dominance, that that wasn't ancient history to them. That was right. a current problem, which I, te- I tend to think we forget about. Um, let, let's go over to the, the area of like sort of moral practice, because you have this in your uh, DNTB article as well. You bring up the, the example of adultery. So can we spend a few minutes on uh, th- this sentence you have here, the threat of dishonor supports a society's prohibitions 
of socially disruptive behavior. For example, adultery, the violation of the sanctity and peace of a bond that is foundational to society, often carries the threat of disgrace. And then you reference Proverbs 6, 32 to 33. So let's just take that. Again, why wasn't it, you know, what was it, uh, would it, would a Jew in the second century feel more apprehension about committing adultery because of the Torah or because of the environs of their culture? I mean, is that a false dichotomy or how would you, how would you talk about that? It's, it's an interesting way to put it. You keep referring to my DNTB article. Have you seen my book, Honor, Patronage, Kinship, and Purity? I don't have that one in my system. So, <laughs> well, so, so I, I'm, I, I'm cheating for quick reference here. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to ask uh, 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 Bob Pritchett if he will unlock this for you <laughs> as a gift. Because <laughs> yeah. there's, there's, there's a lot more uh, in, in there. Uh, so if I am a well-formed, actually Jew or Christian, I care about God's opinion of me. I care about God's judgment, verdict, valuing of me. And so I'm not going to commit adultery because bottom line, I want God to look upon me as an honorable client and, and a grateful recipient of God's favors such that I'm not going to go out and do what is hateful to my divine benefactor. You're going to be loyal to the grace that was shown you. Exactly. Now, if I'm not so well-formed, <laughs> Jew or Christian, and if, yeah, I kind of am interested in God's opinion of me, but, man, she's really hot. <laughs> Social pressure is going to help. Uh, it's going to step in. Mm -hmm. um and uh if if i if i share my thoughts about committing the act my better formed peers are going to shame me into mm -hmm. not if i am so brazen and shameless as to commit the act um and it becomes known i will be ever more deeply shamed because of it Mm -hmm. um, and, and it will take some time to repair my honor rating, if you will, in the community. Um, and, and that, even if, if I don't have any thought about God, my concern about being known as a person of value, my honor rating, as it were, will likely keep me uh, moving in straight paths. Well, well, you just described sanctified peer pressure. There you go. That's well well really, done. <laughs> that's really what, what Paul is after. And other, uh, you know, the author of Hebrews um, is, is deeply interested in sanctified peer pressure. Uh, that author is addressing Christians who have really fallen significantly in their honor rating in the eyes of their non-Christian neighbors, whether those be non-Christian Jews or non-Christian Gentiles. Mm -hmm. and, and it's been a while, and it's wearing on them. It's wearing on them so much that some of them have stopped coming to visibly identify with this Christ cult. They've stopped gathering together. Uh, they've shrunk back, as it were. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the author of Hebrews wants to energize sanctified peer pressure. Uh, watch out, lest there be in any one of you a, a wicked heart of distrust that turns away from the living God. Uh, see to it, and these are the first imperative is plural, see to it, all of you, that no one of you fails to attain God's gift and stuff like that. It, it's just full of uh, exhortations to keep one another on track and keep one another's eyes on um, the honor that the group will bestow upon them and the honor God will bestow upon them. Yeah, and that's an important reference there, just the whole corporate idea, again, sanctified peer pressure, because a lot of those passages, not only in Hebrews, but other places, sort of can be misread as a merit-based, you know, thought system that I have to, you know, I this whole idea of earning your way to heaven, you know, that sort of thing, when, when actually 
it's trying to reinforce your loyalty post commitment, post conversion, you know, your loyalty to the grace that was shown to you and using the community as a benefit. Yeah. You know, for, for doing that. So yeah, that that's that's good stuff. Now how if you were how, how do you let, let me before I get to the question I wanted to ask, uh, I want to ask something about Gentiles. So let's say you're you've heard Paul preach you're a Gentile and your community is quite different in some ways than the Jewish community, your neighbor next door. And you've you've both heard Paul preach, maybe you both let, let for the sake of the scenario, you both believe the message. You both believe in, in, in Jesus. Now, when, when Paul, you know, you overhear some of these discussions and these debates, these conflicts that Paul is having with his community, how are you as a Gentile processing this? What, what do you do if your community would shame you in a different way that would conflict with the Jewish community? I mean, where, how, do you, how do you parse this? What you, know, you, you have access to Paul. You ask him, like, what should I do? What, what, do, you, what do you think you know, the, the thought process would be? Um, how do they approach this if, if they're coming from a totally you know, Gentile orientation? And here we have this guy who sort of you know, stands in the middle of these. How do, what do you think that conversation would be like? If I'm understanding your question correctly, I, I would respond this way to it. Paul does talk to Gentiles who are being shamed by their non-Christian Gentile neighbors in ways very similar Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, Christian Jews who are being shamed by their non-Christian Jewish neighbors. 1 Thessalonians 2 pops into my mind, where Paul talks to a predominantly Gentile Christian audience in Thessalonica. You know, you are suffering the same thing from your compatriots as they suffered, the the Judean churches, suffered from the Jews. Shaming techniques that look quite similar, but are applied because of different values being uh, violated. In the case of the Thessalonian Christians, um, my neighbors, let me be a Thessalonian Christian, my neighbors really are upset that I have ceased to be a pious member of the city, that Mm -hmm. suddenly I am no longer interested in paying the gods their due, or showing solidarity in my family unit, in my uh, social networks, uh, old-fashioned social networks where there actually had to be people with each other, not this (laughs) internet stuff, Uh, showing up in civil uh, settings where, you know, the the whole town is out because sacrifices are being performed uh, to the emperor or to the city's patron deities and we're all going to enjoy a feast together because this is one of the few times we get you know free meat Mm -hmm. in thessalonica and i've become antisocial and i've become uh ironically i've become an atheist this is a word that appears again again uh, in gentile critic sorry non-christian gentile criticisms of christians um so they will do the same things they will avoid my business if i'm if i'm an artisan I'm going to be in jeopardy of losing my livelihood. They will reproach me as they pass in the street. Uh, If I walk down a dark alley, I might get beaten up. And the whole goal is to say, fall back in line for heaven's sake. You used to be a good, valuable, honorable member of this city. Why did you fall for this, this Eastern cult? And why do you listen to that charlatan who blew through here? Uh, you know, Paul. <laughs> right. So, is that getting at what you're asking? Yeah, no, 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 that, that is getting at it. I mean, uh, again, I'm I'm hoping that listeners can see that there's a reason, other than wanting to cloister themselves, there's mm-hmm. a reason why Christians stressed community. It wasn't just you know come out from among them and be separate. Okay, separate from the world and. It wasn't just a negative formation, let's just put it that way. But Christian community was a big deal because of this shame-honor dynamic. I mean, whether you're a Gentile or a Jew, yeah, people are going to avoid your business. You're going to lose your job. You're going to be ostracized. You're going to be shunned. And so the, the creation and, and the, the healthy functioning 
of Christian community is really a more positive thing. It, it's it's to replace that which was lost, not just to, so that we can go off in the hills and cloister ourselves um, and you know do whatever. Uh, which which again, you know, we, we tend to think of withdrawal, you know, from from life and from circumstances when we think of of Christian community, at least in, in a number of our sort of American context. I'm thinking of like fundamentalism or something really mm-hmm. conservative. When, when the reality in, in the New Testament was we have to have a community to help each other get through life because exactly. of these circumstances. Yeah. You know, exactly. it, it's the, the, the approach, the mentality is quite different uh, than what we sort of might be inclined to think. I'm thinking especially of what Jesus said when, when, when Peter said, look, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus said, there's no one who has left behind father or mother or siblings or houses or fields that will not receive a hundredfold in this life, mothers and, and, and siblings and houses and fields and in the life to come, mm-hmm. eternal life, because, um, because we become family to one another. We, uh, by virtue of, of having come together around Jesus, and having been, you know, in Pauline language, adopted by God into his household, we take on the responsibilities and we enjoy the benefits of one another as family. Mm-hmm. Um, and just to, to get back to honor and shame, our interactions with one another, uh, first, our, our relationships with one another and our investments in one another have to be stronger than our relationships with and investments in those who are not Christians, so that our social reinforcement will be more forcefully felt. Paul will urge Christians to exercise, uh, in effect, community discipline to keep um, to keep individuals. Uh, living the new life that Christ has called them to, as opposed to falling back into their old patterns that they, you know, that they might formerly have enjoyed, like the the fellow in First Corinthians five, who uh, who I can't remember the specifics as I sit here, but he was having sex with someone yeah. he wasn't yeah, supposed with his, to. With his father's wife. That much I remember. Uh, or those who are contemplating continuing in in, in fornication. Or, 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 or consorting with, with prostitutes in 1 Corinthians 6. So, you know, you, you just can't be doing this. There's a, there's a new set of values, and we have to hold each other accountable. And if, if that person will not, we, we excommunicate the person. This is kind of the birth of excommunication in 1 Corinthians 5. And we hope that that person's desire for God, who is known as in connection with our community will be greater than his desire for his father's Mm ex-wife. Yeah, really. Last question uh, before I want to give you a chance again to talk about any, any of your books that you want to just describe. And I do have one question in the Galatians commentary, but um, last question, as far as the subject matter, if you were shamed, if you lost honor, how would it be regained? I mean, you, you hinted at this in what you just said with First Corinthians five. The issue there is repentance. You, you know, your expulsion is is ultimately aimed at restoration. But you know, if you can widen that a little bit, you're you're a believer. You've been shamed. How you know? How do you regain your honor? If you wish to continue as a believer, you you regain it by repenting, by going you know uh, through the the process of of restoration of the community it's not so well spelled out in the first century but it actually becomes quite developed in the second and third centuries and and it's really in its conceptualization a very positive uh, uh, a process to specifically to restore honor and value to the person who was turned away from those sinful practices there's another side to that of course um, at any point, I can also regain my honor in the eyes of the non-Christian world by repenting mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and and find my way back into the the 
the good graces and respect of my peers because I have put aside these foreign, these atheistic commitments. Yeah, ultimately, it's which, which, which honor community, which honor do you esteem more? Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, that obviously, I think we can all, you know, sense that that would have been a, a real struggle, you know, for for many people, both, you know, now and of course, in antiquity. What, what were some of the steps just real quickly in the second and third century? Because I know they had a big problem, like even with the Nicene or yeah, the Nicene Creed, there, there are parts of that that deal with people who have lapsed. OK, you know, and what to do. But what, what are some of the steps? I got to be honest, this late on a Friday afternoon where I am, <laughs> I don't have them. I, I know there were there was preparation of fasting and repentance, uh, especially during the uh, the pre-Easter season and, and a public uh, restoration, welcoming back into the community and to the Lord's table at the, uh, the Easter vigil service. Uh, which gave birth to our practices of Lent from Ash Wednesday to to Easter, but more than that, I cannot say. Well, that's a good one, though. That, that, that's a that's a pretty concrete uh, example. Um, what we're going to do is, uh, for sure, I'm going to give uh, Trey the links to uh, your Honor Patronage Kinship and Purity book, so that people can find that real easily, and the Galatians commentary. In regard to the Galatians commentary. How would you describe this? Do you need facility with Greek to benefit from this commentary? Um, someone without Greek, can they get a lot out of it still? How would you describe it? I think the latter. The, the New International Commentary on the New Testament, and Joel Green, the current editor, is really quite um, good and adamant about this. Mm-hmm. It is meant to, to serve pastors, not necessarily scholars. Mm-hmm. So especially the main running text is uh, it's got to be accessible mm-hmm. uh, or else Joel just isn't going to have it. <laughs> <laughs> the footnotes, I just to be honest, could be another story, yeah. but that's OK. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the, it, it has a ton that uh, those who have no facility in Greek will be able to to grasp and Every writer for the series is careful to explain grammatical terms mm-hmm. and what have you, and at least lay out clearly what the what the differences are in English, so that it can be readily grasped. Good, good. Well, we'll, we'll be sure to put a link to that on the episode page. Is there anything else you'd like to tell us about that either you've you know, put out well, in the past or is coming in the near future? If I might, I I am very excited about the apocrypha. I think that, you know, cultural backgrounds are great, honor, patronage, reciprocity. Mm-hmm. Um, textual backgrounds that are right at our fingertips are great. And the Apocrypha is just the best collection of Second Temple Jewish literature that our readers, uh, sorry, that your listeners can easily find and read. Mm-hmm. And the second edition of my textbook, Introducing the Apocrypha, just came out earlier this year with Baker. Um, I'm very happy that they gave me the opportunity to revise, update uh, uh, this volume. And in about a month, the second edition of my introduction to the New Testament will come out with InterVarsity Press. And again, it's a, it's a, a major investment that a press makes to create a second edition. And I'm grateful for the chance to update, to correct a bunch of things. And, uh, <laughs> you know, archaeology especially, because since between the first and the second edition, I've actually gotten to visit most New Testament sites. And I've decided, and I've discovered, oh, heck, that's really over there, not over there like I thought, <laughs> and, and, and what have you. So Google Earth so. let me down. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first edition, I didn't have yeah, Google Earth. Right. So okay, well, what, what we'll do is on the on the episode uh, page for this uh, episode, we will put a link also to the uh, to the new edition of the invitation of the, the apocrypha, the introduction there. And when the New Testament new edition drops, shoot me an email about that. I mean, I I, I may see it in the catalog. I saw the apocrypha one in the uh, in the Baker catalog recently uh but shoot me an email about that so we can put something on the blog about it excellent thank you so much mike 
Yeah, well, thank you for spending part of your Friday with us. A great pleasure. All right, Mike, another great interview. Yeah, it's always good to talk to David and get a lot of good in insights on some things that we can, again, easily read over, but uh, that are actually pretty important. And next week, we're going to have uh, two interviews with Johnny and Joe. Um, yep, some friends of ours who are, are doing some interesting things to get both to raise money, again, for the persecuted church and also to get uh, good resources, good tools into the hands of really anybody who cares about uh, Bible study. All right, that sounds good. Looking forward to it. All righty, just want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.